Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, and I'd like to welcome you all today. My name is Kenneth Whitwer. I'm the Chair of Science and Meetings of the International Society for EVs, or ISEV. Um, and I have a special pleasure to introduce our speakers today, uh, one of whom is Professor Edit Buzesh. And so uh, Dr. Buzesh is one of the first people that I met in the International Society for EVs. Um, and one of the people I, I, I really respect the most because I know her as a very careful scientist and is an incredible person as well. Uh, and she has played numerous roles with ISEV over the years. And I would, I would now like to um, invite Esther here. And, and Edit, would you like to introduce Esther and uh, you know, just give us a little bit of the background for this work? And, um, and Esther, you can then go ahead and start sharing your screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's it's a, a big pleasure to me to introduce you, Esther Tote. Uh, she is my PhD student, and she's an MD, and currently she works as a physician. She even uh, uh, treats COVID patients at this moment <laughs> in the hospital. So she <laughs> she has a lot of things on her shoulders, but but uh, she spent the past couple of years, I think you, Esther, you have been working on this project for four or five years, am I correct? Yes, yes. <laughs> Approximately. So she joined our laboratory as an undergraduate research student, and then then she decided to, to do a PhD with us. And uh, she had an interruption. She went to the UK to Exeter, uh, where she had again some clinical practice. So she's a nice example how you can, how to say, uh, balance uh, clinical uh, practice and also laboratory research. Uh, but taking turns, I mean, not at the same time, but but one after the other. So I I ask Esther to to share her screen and and um, kindly. Uh, advance the slides, uh, I, I just somehow cannot share my screen. So I will uh, give you a little bit of background about the project. And I ask uh, Esther to, to show the first slide uh, to give you a background how we started this, this whole uh, interest in protein corona or proteins associated with EVs is that long time back, we found that extracellular vesicles and protein aggregates, uh, protein complexes share uh, multiple biophysical parameters with vesicles. I mean, size distribution is sort of similar. Uh, they share light scattering and sedimentation properties. And so we came to the conclusion quite early on that EV preparations might be contaminated with protein complexes or aggregates. So if you just have a look uh, at this atomic for force microscopy image on the left, it shows you extracellular vesicles. On the right, it shows you uh, antigen antibody complexes. And as you can tell, there are structures which have really overlapping size. With NT, both particles scatter the, the illuminating laser light. Can you move on, Esther, please? And when we had a look at the pellet, extracellular vesicle pellet, from synovial fluid samples of rheumatoid arthritis, or osteoarthritis patients, we found um, quite repeatedly that we have the vesicular membranes surround these structures. And among them, indeed, we have something that is not vesicular. We thought those were uh, protein complexes, maybe immune complexes. Esther, can you advance the slide, please? And so to distinguish extracellular vesicles from, from uh, protein complexes, we introduced the differential detergent lysis for flow cytometry. On the left-hand side, you see intact vesicles. And if you add Triton X100, then uh, the, the vesicular structure, at least in the case of the MEVs, disappears. Can you move on, please? Uh, so we, we decided that uh, if we want to be more or less precise when determining the number of extracellular vesicles by flow cytometry, we better subtract the triton resistant events from the vesicle number, from the EV number. And maybe that is the one that gives us the realistic uh, EV number. So we, we decided to subtract the, the contaminating uh, protein complex particles. Over uh, there in the right, uh, right button uh, uh, corner, you see the, uh, the uh, flow cytometry images of the annexin 
five uh, labeled rheumatoid arthritis synovial fluid samples before and after triton lysis. And as you can see, the annexin signal disappears upon addition of triton virus. The anti IgM antibody uh, uh, visualizes signals which do not disappear upon the addition of triton, suggesting that those are not vesicles, these are rather immune complexes. Esther, can you move the slide, please? So indeed, we thought uh, to distinguish vesicles from contaminating proteins, protein aggregates, uh, detergent lysis could be a good way. And so we uh, determined the concentration that is capable of lysing extracellular vesicles, uh, and we included detergents like SDS, Triton X100, and Twin20. And we, we even determined that small EVs are more resistant to detergent lysis than the bigger one. The other, uh, the other tool we thought could be useful to distinguish vesicular uh, structures from non-vesicular protein aggregates um, was to, to determine the, uh, the lipid content of our preparation. We introduced a very simple uh, SPV colorimetric uh, lipid assay, and we decided that uh, uh, from that time on when we introduce this assay, every time we have a new extracellular vesicle preparation, we determine not only the protein content, but also the, the total lipid content with this SPV assay. So if you compare EVs with protein aggregates, and if you determine the particle number, either by NTA or tunable resistive pulse sensing, you may find high particle number uh, in both cases. If you determine the protein concentration, for example, by the BC micro BCSC, again, you may get high concentration. However, if you do the lipid assay, while in EVs you can have a high lipid concentration, you find no lipid in the protein aggregates. And if you apply differential detergent lysis, it might enable you to distinguish vesicles from protein aggregates. At least in the medium size uh, EV range, it sufficiently uh, uh, disintegrates uh, the vesicular membrane, whereas the protein aggregates are pretty uh, resistant to the differential detergent lysis. But then we, we came to the idea that what if our EVs are associated with proteins or protein aggregates? What if individual proteins or protein aggregates actually bind onto the surface of EVs. We thought that this would not be unprecedented because uh, in our laboratory earlier on, we found that, for example, LDL particles could form a kind of corona around uh, NOS and extracellular vesicles, or we found an association of DNA with the external surface of, of small EVs. Uh, upon exposure of jerked cells to, to the genotoxic antibiotic ciprofloxacin. Indeed, even in, in the published literature, there are examples that show you that uh, certain proteins, we know that bind to the surface of extracellular vesicles. Albumin is known to bind through membrane thiols. Uh, TNF-alpha can bind through TNF receptor 1. And TGF-beta and CCL2 uh, chemokine uh, can bind to uh, EV surface proteoglycans, whereas uh, EV surface integrins uh, or CD44 can bind vesicles to extracellular matrix molecules. In the literature, uh, for many years, people uh, described a protein, a, a protein corona forming uh, around non biological nanoparticles. And also, they found that in biological fluids, liposome. Um, uh, develop a protein corona, um, like spontaneously, we have a formation of, of protein corona around liposomes as well in biological fluids. Also, the same holds true for lipid nanoparticles. And what was really intriguing for us, that virus particles, which, which are quite similar to extracellular vesicles, they were also recently shown to, to have a protein corona around them in biological fluids. So we asked the question, could it be that we have a protein corona around extracellular vesicles as well? And so we thought it was very challenging because uh, while in other cases, uh, Anything that is a protein bound to, to the structure comes from the protein corona. In this case, all proteins are from the same organism, both EV proteins and the corona proteins. So it was a real challenge, but we decided to address this question somehow. 
And now I really hand over to Esther and ask her to, to tell you about her experiments. Yes, thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to say thank you that uh, I can present our work here because it's such a uh, great honor for me. And uh, after Edith has kindly introduced how challenging it was to study the protein corona OPVs, I would like to just briefly summarize what we actually did. Um, so our experimental setup was the following. Uh, to overcome the problem that uh, EVs and their possible corona are from the same species, we came up with the following uh, method. So we took the medium-sized uh, EVs uh, cultured uh, from, um, or sorry, isolated from um, uh, THP1 cells kept in serum-free culture or from uh, washed platelets and immersed them in EV-depleted blood plasma. Um, incubated the vesicles in the plasma samples for 30 uh, minutes on room temperature, and then re-isolated the vesicles with three different methods. So either we use differential centrifugation or more clean methods like density gradient ultracentrifugation and uh, size exclusion chromatography. And we hoped that after the 30 minutes, those proteins that wanted to associate with the EVs might already have uh, uh, did it so it, they, they associated uh, to the surface of the EVs. Uh, we used the following controls. So we used uh, nascent EVs. We call nascent those EVs uh, that were not incubated in, uh, in plasma samples, just in a simple uh, buffer. We used uh, sodium chloride HEPAS buffer for this purpose. And also we used um, the EV depleted plasma samples without the addition of vesicles. And we code the pellets or uh, the, the vesicular fractions, for example, in the case of density gradient ultracentrifugation, um, protein aggregates. So from now on, uh, when I say protein aggregates in our work, I refer to these. And also we use the more simplified method using uh, fibrinogene. Um, uh, recombinant fibrinogene, we incubated uh, some nascent vesicles in recombinant fibrinogene. And to see how the plasma vesicles actually looked like, we used uh, a very clean method to, uh, to rule out the possibility that somehow the centrifugation methods just uh, interrupted our uh, plan. And so we used this annexing 5 based affinity uh, isolation method to see how our plasma vesicles really looked like. Um, and so our, one of our main methods was mass spectrometry. We analyzed the proteomics of EVs incubated in uh, EV depleted blood plasma, as well as of nascent EVs. And we decided to uh, subtract the protein list of the nascent EVs from the list of the coated ones. So this way we could receive the list of proteins that were newly associated somehow to the vesicles. You can see here the 61 proteins that we found in more than 30% of the samples, in all, of all samples. And you can see that we had uh, 20 proteins here that were found, uh, that were identified in more than 90% of uh, all of our samples. Uh, the size of the column indicates uh, the percentage a given protein was identified in all samples. And the color scale here uh, shows you the likelihood a given protein was found uh, more likely in rheumatoid arthritis patients, uh, blood plasma, uh, or healthy subjects, blood plasma. The more orange the, the color is, the more likely it was to find uh, the, the protein associated to vesicles in rheumatoid arthritis uh, patients' samples. And also, you can see here these little icons, and these will show you um, which method we, uh, we isolated uh, the, the vesicles in, uh, on which we found the given proteins. Um, so most proteins were uh, identified with differential centrifugation, I mean, after differential centrifugation. And we were at first very uh, amazed, and I guess uh, most of you are, that albumin is not on the list. But behind this, the reason is that albumin was actually found on uh, our nascent vesicle samples as well. And we have uh, many theories for this. For example, we actually found uh, albumin uh, made also in our THP1 cells home factory. So somehow our THP1 cells were themselves producing albumin. 
and also the reason uh, could be that too that um, there uh, there is a known effect of FBS contamination. So even though we put ourselves into serum feed culture uh, 24 hours before the uh, vesicle isolation. Um, actually, there is still some uh, FBS uh, remains uh, in the in the serum free culture, probably because the cells eat it up, let's say, and so it's possible to 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 find it with mass spectrometry later on. So we ran down uh, our um, protein, our proteomics in the bovine database to and it showed that uh, there is also um, bovine albumin in our samples. Um, we were interested how common it is to identify these plasma proteins among the vesicle works, and so we searched some uh, EV databases. We chose the 20 proteins that were found in more than 90% of our samples obtained with uh, differential centrifugation and with a few exceptions, you can see that they were all found in quite a high number. And uh, what was really interesting to see was that mostly the works that listed uh, these plasma proteins were actually not working with blood plasma, showing that EVs might carry proteins with themselves outside, outside the bloodstream as well. And Wesicopedia also pro provides the list of top uh, 100 proteins. And you can see uh, here that actually it, it's a bit confusing because you can see it's just 92 proteins, but the reason behind this is that histone 4, for example, has more uh, gene symbols and we were using protein uh, symbols for our work. So uh, this is the reason behind this uh, confusing uh, finding. But you can see here that actually 27 uh, proteins of our nascent EVs were identified in the Vesicopedia top hits as well. And you can see here uh, in the intersection um, um, how many proteins of our work uh, were identified in the Vesicopedia top hits. Uh, and it's quite a high number. We also were interested how much are EV's protein corona is similar to the coronas of artificial nanoparticles. And so uh, we chose a work in which the authors analyzed the corona with lipid nanoparticles and two different uh, viri, uh, respiratory syncytial virus and uh, herpes simplex virus. Um, and for our uh, luck, all uh, particles they were analyzing were in the same size range of REVs and they incubated uh, their particles in, in the same uh, human sample. So with this method, we found nine uh, common proteins um, that suggested that this could be a kind of universal uh, uh, protein corona proteins. And once again, you cannot see albumin here as we could not include it in our list due to its pre presence in our nascent samples. Uh, most of these universal proteins could also be detected on EVs that we isolated directly from blood plasma with a very clean isolation method. So we chose annexin based, annexin 5 based magnetic bead isolation for this. This way we didn't have to use centrifugation. And we detected uh, these proteins, also the vesicular uh, protein CD63. Um, in plasma derived uh, uh, vesicles with, uh, with capillary Western blotting. The presence of the EV corona uh, was also indirectly showed by our DGUC, density gradient or centrifugation finding. You can see that those EVs that were coated in plasma showed a higher flotation density. And I personally just couldn't wait for the microscopy part of the ver work. Um, um, you believe what you see. So uh, we could show the protein corona with transmission electron microscopy. And you can see that those CD63 and some corona proteins uh, together can be shown, uh, can be seen, and also some um, uh, cohabitation of, of uh, different corona proteins uh, can be seen uh, on uh, some pictures with immune gold labeling. And on ultra thin uh, sections using a simplified corona model, uh, we saw that fibrinogen coated vesicles showed a more fluffy picture compared to the nascent ones. And 
even in microscopy, my favorite part was the confocal microscopy part. Here we use fluorescent labeled antiprotein antibodies on dio stained vesicles and found these beautiful flower meadow like vesicles showing either uh, patchly binding or like this uh, aggregate like binding uh, to the vesicle surface. And we also analyzed the uh, interaction between the corona proteins themselves and the EV membrane proteins. You can see these are indicated with different colors, either purple or this uh, black color, and found a significant interaction here. And again, uh, using a simplified model with fluorescent fibrinogen, uh, we could remove the fibrinogen from our EVs with high salt concentration uh, washing using um, uh, flow cytometry to detect the removal of of the uh, fluorescent uh, fibrinogen binding. And one very interesting aspect of our work was the uh, confusing finding of protein aggregates. So once again, we named protein aggregates the pellets of EV depleted plasma samples without the addition of EVs. And you can see that even with more pure methods than differential centrifugation, there was a huge overlap between coated EVs and uh, these protein aggregates. And we tried to get rid of these protein aggregates. We wanted to see how it might be possible to get rid of them. So we used uh, serious centrifugation. And even after six rounds of centrifugation, we still could uh, find um, um, detectable protein concentration of the, of the pellet. While you can see that we, we could not see any uh, lipids in uh, any yeah, lipids in, in these uh, pellets using the, uh, the lipid assay Edith has mentioned. And uh, we also used uh, Kunano, so TRPS uh, method. And we, uh, you can see here that meanwhile, uh, with the Triton X detergent lysis, we could get rid of the vesicles in this case. We could not get rid of the, uh, uh, the protein aggregates. Uh, indicating uh, that these are actually protein aggregates. And even though they are in a lower concentration than the vesicles, uh, it can be quite confusing in the studies. And it, what's also kind of confusing is that they show a similar um, appearance in electron microscopy and fluorescent microscopy as well. But here you can see, for example, that you cannot see the, the nice dio stained vesicles under the, the protein corona. And we also were interested uh, in the, if, the, uh, if the protein corona has any kind of functional effect. So we used the model of induced dendritic cells and uh, we treated them um, with uh, either nascent DVs or coated DVs, either with rheumatoid arthritis uh, plasma coat or calcite plasma coat. And we also used the protein aggregates or either rheumatoid arthritis patients or healthy people. And in contrast to the nascent EVs and the protein aggregates, you can see that the coating increased the inflammatory phenotype of the uh, dendritic cells significantly. Uh, in this case, we could not find a difference between the rheumatoid arthritis or the healthy uh, coat, but the effect of the coat was, uh, uh, was quite significant. And uh, we also did a gene enrichment uh, analysis uh, you can see here uh, uh, the, the corona proteins, how much the corona proteins um, um, participate in different uh, um, biological processes. I mean, how, yeah, uh, how, in what percentage they, uh, they add to different biological processes. And also um, we analyzed uh, the peripheral blood, uh, cell take up of uh, dio stained vesicles and so after 45 minutes of uh, of incubation we saw a significant um a significant uh, association of the nascent and corona coated uh, evs and it was more significant in the case of uh, protein corona uh, coated evs with uh, peripheral blood lymphocytes so taken together, we can say that the protein corona uh, forms spontaneously around EVs in blood plasma. And the composition of the protein corona might show correlation with health and disease. So it might also serve as a potential biomarker. 
and our data may provide explanation for the presence of the blood plasma protein contamination. Whether it's a contamination or not, uh, it's up to you to decide, found often in, in uh, plasma-derived EV samples. Uh, and finally, I would, I would like to highlight my colleagues who participated in, uh, in this work. And I would like to say thank you for, for all of them and say thank you for your attendance. But now I would like to give back the word uh, to, to uh, Edith, who, who might say a few further respects of this work. Thank you very much. Just to put these findings into a context, I would like to first refer to a previous EV Club presentation by Pia Siliander and Maria Palveainen, who talked about uh, the EV protein corona formation around vesicles in human plasma. And this study that I'm just mentioning now, in a synergistic way with our findings, demonstrated that that there are shared proteins uh, between previously published EV proteomes, as well as nanoparticle protein coronas and the PFP pellets, uh, platelet-free uh, uh, plasma uh, pellets of the authors. And they could even demonstrate that anticoagulants had some impact on the EV protein corona. Can you move on, Esther? Uh, there is a paper uh, which uh, mentions uh, innate and acquired biocorona. And I think this is quite uh, important. And I've seen a question in the chat box, which was uh, kind of related to this. Indeed, we know examples when inside the multivesicular bodies, there is an association of certain molecules like fibronectin or C3B. Uh, uh, with the surface of, of the intraluminal vesicles that are going to be secreted as exosomes. So those uh, molecules that associate inside the multivesicular body with the surface of the intraluminal vesicles, they could be considered as components of the innate biocorona, as opposed to the acquired biocorona about which Esther talked. And I assume that this is what Pia Siliander's group has also uh, proposed to, 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 to have around vesicles. Can you move on, please? Uh, and about the functional aspects of the EV protein corona, let me mention two papers. One has demonstrated that the extracellular vesicle associated fibrinogen is capable of inducing an autoimmune encephalopathogenic uh, CD8 T cell response in a mouse model of multiple sclerosis. So the presence or absence of a vesicle associated molecule fibrinogen might determine whether the mice will develop an autoimmune uh, disease, a model disease of multiple sclerosis. And also it has been demonstrated that uh, if the vesicles were isolated from brain metastasis, then they induce the binding and aggregation of LDL lipoprotein. Can you move on, please? Uh, I would like to, to mention an interesting just accepted paper. Uh, the last author authorized me to mention this paper in this EV club presentation, that the authors found a functional corona around EVs, which in their hands enhances angiogenesis, skin regeneration, and immunomodulation. This is a group from the group of, uh, this is a work from the group of Dirk Strunk. Can you move on, please? Also, the recently multifunctional exosome mimetics were developed uh, for targeted uh, anti-glioblastoma therapy. And in this, the authors manipulated the protein corona. Uh, the exosome mimetics was uh, loaded with a drug and uh, the, the uh, corona was an artificially introduced angiopep2, which enhanced uh, the absorption, uh, uh, which uh, increased the uh, phagocytosis of, of uh, 
sorry, they have, I start all over again. So the authors used uh, decoration and artificial protein corona around these vesicles, and the outcome was a better therapeutic uh, impact, uh, enhanced blood-brain barrier penetrance, and uh, lowered absorption of serum proteins and phagocytosis by macrophages. Esther, can you move on, please? And uh, about the functionality of the EV protein corona, I would like to highlight that many of these uh, molecules that we and others uh, identified in the corona around EVs, uh, including apolipoproteins or albumin or, or uh, 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 other uh, apolipoprotein molecule set, or even the globulins, they fall into the category of opsonin or disopsonins. Opsonins are the molecules that facilitate the, the phagocytic uptake, and these opsonins are the molecules which, which uh, inhibit or um, uh, reduce the uh, phagocytic uptake of certain structures. And as you can see, some of the molecules that we identified in this study around the EVs fall into either the opsonin or the disopsonin category. Can you move on, please? Uh, I would like to also mention a paper in which the authors used uh, microfluidic resistive pulse sensing and very small angular neutron scattering, and they estimated the uh, possible thickness of the protein corona around the EVs. Their estimation uh, suggested that it is around 5.3 uh, nanometer. So that was the last slide. With that, I thank you uh, for your attention, and, and we are looking forward to your questions. Indeed, we are, and I think that this work has uh, given everybody some food for thought, and we're we're seeing the the evidence of that in the chat box. Uh, but but thank you, um, thank you both for presenting here. Thank you for this excellent work, and then thank you also, um, Edit for 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 giving us an overview too of of what else has been shown in the field so far. So this is quite exciting, you know, to see so much developing at once. So uh, I, I would like to now uh, unmute uh, or allow unmuting. So if you have put a question in the chat box, um, please be prepared to unmute yourself when I call on you, and then you can interact with Edit and Esther. So I will give the first word to, uh, to Phil Askenes. Um, Phil, you had a question here about function, and I think we've heard a little bit about function, but I'm sure that you have uh, maybe some follow-up here. No, it's a very complex thing uh, about the function of these uh, proteins. It's really introduced uh, greater complexity these are unusually caref careful studies of a very difficult matter. Um, I, Ed, I wrote you about our uh, light chains in the murine systems, not human and not plasma. In your case, I think kappa chains were about 10% um, in, in, in the quantitation. And I wonder if in your case, the um, this gives the vesicles antigen specificity. Uh, well, uh, we haven't tested it yet, to be honest. It's a very exciting question indeed. Uh, we have uh, found that we, we listed among these uh, potential universal corona proteins, uh, heavy chains of certain immunoglobulins, and indeed you, you have demonst demonstrated uh, light chains. We haven't tested if there is a chance that these are functional antibodies that's written their specificity. Well, yeah, you're working with rheumatoid arthritis and, you know, these are, uh, make things even more difficult, but certainly uh, clinically very relevant uh, of, uh, and to material. I mean, to be tremendously uh, congratulated with the diversity. Um, I guess one of the questions is the, the different kinds of, is your cell line a macrophage cell line that you're mainly working with? Uh, the, in this work, yeah, so in this work, we, we, we use, as Esther mentioned, cell line, the THP1 cell line, and also platelet concentrate uh, uh, derived vesicles, so platelet vesicles. What is THP1? It's a, it's a, say it, okay. Is a macrophage cell line? It's a myeloid uh, cell line. Uh -huh. yeah, it's a myositic uh, okay. cell line. Well, thank you both very much. And thank you for the, the question and comments, Phil. Uh, let's move now to Catherine Miller-Haskell, who has a question 
a little bit about biogenesis, but then also about some of the implications um, and, and a possible synthetic. So Catherine, go ahead. Yeah, my question is like a three-parter. So I was curious if, um, if nascent EVs have a corona, and you did kind of answer that, um, but I was curious about um, putting those EVs into the plasma and then picking up proteins, because um, I'm curious if that's just something that is a known mechanism and whether the, like where the application of this would be, would it be to potentially make artificial or is this like, this is an explanation for how coronas and are endogenously made, in, I guess, in, in people or in mammals? I don't know if I like asked that. I'm not sure I, I completely understood your question, but so so uh, I I think uh, these these vesicles and the adsorbed proteins could reflect uh, a lot of processes in the body, in body fluids where we don't expect to have as high protein concentration as in blood plasma. Uh, we assume that we don't expect to have the same uh, corona uh, composition. And it gives us an opportunity recogni recognizing that certain proteins can clearly adsorb onto the surface of the vesicles to, to uh, design or, or prepare pro uh, extracellular vesicle preparations. Uh, with artificial uh, coronas, which might, as I showed you in this example of the exosome mimic, uh, uh, we can we can actually benefit from this property of EVs that that a lot of proteins can adsorb onto the surface. We can we can make them less binding, for example, to to phagocytes. Maybe we can we can try to avoid liver elimination from so elimination of the circulating vesicles very rapidly as it happens. And so it gives us again, a new tool into our hands to, to kind of uh, better um, uh, target vesicles uh, to, to cells where we want to have a local effect. And if, if I just might add a few things to uh, what just came to my mind um, about your question is that uh, actually, with artificial nanoparticles, we already know that if we put them into the real bloodstream, the protein corona that forms there is actually like 60% different from what we see in our petri dishes. So, so it's kind of, I think it's still a long way to go to, to know how we could use the protein corona to, to modify on purpose the, the effect of extracellular vesicles that we then place back to the body because we know that it will be kind of different from what we see out in, outside the body. Yeah, so it might be a bit difficult in my opinion. Thank you. Our next question is from another ISEB board member, Metka Lanasi, who is also my uh, co-moderator on a session two weeks ago. So uh, Metka, go ahead with your question. Oh, I think, uh, hi Esther, really great, um, hi Edith and Esther, really great talk, um, and um, I think that you partly already answered my question, um, but I was just wondering, um, is this, do you know, is this binding specific or at least partly specific, or is it just dependent on the concentration of proteins in the uh, body fluid? And if that is dependent on the concentration of the proteins in the body fluid, how do you then, let's say, if you would do a, um, if you would then uh, synthetically add some protein corona before adding this, um, let's say, change um, vesicles into the bloodstream? Um, how would this affect? I mean, would um, would there be a competition for binding, and would then the blood plasma proteins just, you know, um, bind to the EVs and remove the other ones, the ones that you actually want them? to bind for therapeutical reasons. Just, yeah, something about that, if you could um, add something. So I, I think uh, there could be a specific interaction between certain receptors and ligands, but but for sure there is electrostatic non-specific interaction. And also we, we suspect that there is an induced aggregation around the vesicles. So these vesicles may serve as a, a centers of aggregation. And if you remember this, this uh, figure where we show the significant interactions between the corona proteins, it was very striking. So they do have a tendency to, to interact with one another, to bind to each other. And your question is, 
absolutely right food. It depends on affinity of binding. If in the plasma there will be a, a, a molecule that has a higher affinity, yes, indeed, the, that can dynamically replace the one that is already attached onto the surface of the physical. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Metka. And uh, we have actually a J Joy Park. You have two questions, one of which has also been endorsed by May Mahoney. So, um, so why don't you go ahead and ask both of your questions? Hi, both. Um, I'm a PhD student at Dr. Andres Pearl's lab. I had a question about um, one of your slides, I think, spoke about EVs isolated from plasma. Um, so I was wondering if you've also looked at EVs from serum um, related to protein corona. No, we uh, thank you for the question. So we only worked with plasma, plasma protein protein. So we, we didn't look at the serum. Okay, is there a reason for that or it ju that's just your... Um, um, there is no well, it was our, well, it was our decision at the beginning that we, we will work with plasma. So there's no very specific reason to that. Mm. Okay. Um, also, my second question was when you were speaking about cytokines, um, did you differentiate between the cytokines that were bound to the EVs um, versus the cytokines contained inside the EVs? Um, I'm not sure which part do you mean? Um, Sorry. It was, it was very brief. Um, it was towards the end. I think it was about TGF beta. Maybe um, you had some bar charts. And I was wondering if you, um, when you quantified, did you differentiate between the cytokines that are on the outside of the EVs versus inside? Because um, I've read mm -hmm. that a lot of cytokines are contained inside the EVs. Um, Maybe you refer to this figure that I have shown that it is published already that, that for example, TGF-beta is bound to the vesicle surface, beta-glycan, proto-glycan, to the glycosamine mm -hmm. glycan gene of it. So, but it was not our own uh, data. It is from the literature. Okay. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that's the figure that I was talking about, but okay. Um, that's is it great? I just shared the screen again. I don't know. Uh, so you can point at the, the slide you meant or... Okay. Yeah. So. So. And you're welcome. Welcome to follow up to um to after after the journal club to to um to to find out which slide that was and and yeah hopefully get an answer to the question. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Let's then go to Jolene Phelps, who has uh, who also has a couple of questions. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Actually, it was really interesting, and I've kind of been looking at a bit of this with my own work. But um, the first question I had was when you were talking about measuring purity. Uh, looking at a protein for lipid ratio, did you consider kind of contamination by other lipids? Um, or, you know, when you lyse the particles, did you consider maybe the generation of micelles upon after their lyse? I think it's a very important point. You are right in that, that we have to distinguish samples. If we are talking, for example, about plasma samples, uh, lipid determination will not uh, be meaningful because indeed we have a lot of lipoproteins there. However, if we have a cell line and, and uh, we don't expect it to, to secrete a lot of lipoproteins, then, then in this, in this serum-free condition, we can consider that, that the protein-lipid ratio might be very important. And also when you have a, a separated uh, preparation, then in that you can a look at the protein to lipid ratio. But indeed, I mean, lipid determination is not specific and other sources of lipids can be there. And then the second question I was, I guess more of an application and you guys have kind of already talked about this before, but I guess, for example, if we're culturing in kind of like a chemically defined or serum free media where we have the addition of proteins or, you know, things like lipid concentrate or um, albumin, do you think there'd be kind of a benefit to having more of a, like a lower purity EV population that kind of still contains a lot of these proteins and things um, in terms of like a therapeutic application. Make sense? <laughs> So uh, albumin, serum albumin is a disopsonin. So it, it uh, uh, how to say, interferes with, with uh, phagocytic cell uptake of vesicles, whether it's good or not for our purpose. We can decide, but, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, I would say that if we, if we harvest our vesicles in, uh, in a 
condition where you have either proteins or or serum of course it's more close to the physiological condition somebody in this chat box asked if there is such thing as nascent ev uh, and what's the function of it i think immediately as soon as a vesicle is secreted into a, a protein containing extracellular environment it gets within seconds coated by proteins so so uh, uh, nascent uh, vesicle only exists if if we artificially culture the cells in in a serum free environment. But but if I could follow up on that edit, does that mean then uh, that that there could be no differences in 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 the corona based on biogenesis, or or is it is it possible that an exosome in the endosomal environment is going to have a slightly different corona than something that is budding from the from the cell surface and thus is always exposed to that extra, truly extracellular environment. I think the membrane curvature might determine also what kind mm. of a protein corona is formed. And indeed, I mean, maybe oh. uh, intra, in, in, in the multivesical body, indeed, maybe uh, different uh, proteins get absorbed onto the surface of the intraluminal vesicles Very as good. compared to the extracellular environment. Good, all right. Uh, we have a question next from B. Milutinovich. That would be me. It's Boyana. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I was wondering, because you mentioned that uh, you use the high salt concentration to remove proteins from the corona, and I was wondering how this refers to an ion exchange phase means of exosome isolation. Uh, could, this, could this mean that these vesicles that are, ex uh, that are isolated to an ion exchange are somehow stripped of coronal proteins? Could this be exploited as a uh, as means to load these vesicles, like rearrange the corona or something like that? Could this be um, a manufacturing opportunity or workflow? Thank you. Yeah. Esther, you would like to <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion, yeah. um, basically everything might change the protein corona. So, um, so in my opinion, yes, uh, um, this method will change the protein corona because, it, um, as far as um, we know, in the case of artificial nanoparticles, basically a little alteration of the environment already uh, has big effect of the protein corona. Uh, mainly if it changes the soft corona. So in artificial nanoparticles, we already know that there's a hard protein corona and the soft corona and the outside. So this soft corona part is that's more um, um, variable uh, if we place the, the nanoparticle in some other uh, environment. So in my opinion, I don't know, what Ellie thinks, but in my opinion, it, it uh, changes the, the protein form. Yeah. Good. Uh, thank you for the question, Boyana. Um, we, we now have a question from John Sperduto. And so um, he, he notes that separating uh, large proteins and lipoproteins from EVs can be quite tricky. And I think that your group has, has largely written the book on that. So you're, you're very well aware of that. But John, do you want to ask about some of these other techniques? Yeah, I was just curious, um, have you considered repeating these with a higher, so I come from more of a bioprocessing and engineering background, have you considered using higher resolution uh, resins and columns and gradients? So for example, you know, SuperDex or SuperOS, et cetera, and longer continuous gradients instead of discontinuous linear gradients to see if you could further resolve things um, because most of the corona proteins and lipoproteins you list are, you know, in, in the viral vector world and similar, least size particles are exceedingly tricky to fully separate. Yeah, so I think uh, what you suggest is absolutely, uh, how to say, rightful. I mean, we may achieve better resolution, better separation. However, we, we do believe that there is a true association and and even the very strong shear forces of ultracentrifugation uh, would not detach these apolipoproteins from the surface of vesicles. So, so if 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 you see, we can we can grab the vesicles through the surface annexin five, and and no matter of no matter how many times we extensively wash the vesicles, we can still see these these. Uh, 
apolipoproteins associated to the vesicular surface. So uh, I, I don't think that even if we apply a better resolution column, we completely get rid of those. Very good. And we have already, uh, so Hai Ying Zhang, thank you for your question, which um, Professor Buzesh has already addressed. Now she's pulled that from uh, the chat box. So we will move on to Raihana. You have a question about the EV depleted plasma. Uh, thank you so much for your amazing talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, since we have like heterogeneous EVs inside the plasma, how are you sure about the protein aggregation control? Uh, when you're using, I mean, the process, in the process of depleting the EVs, you could also get rid of the protein aggregates during the centrifugation. How are you sure about this control? Uh, I understand. Yeah, um, sorry. Okay, so I collect my thoughts. Um, the centrifugation itself might induce protein aggregation for sure. And um, um, meanwhile, we think that with these controls, uh, for sure it's not totally possible to rule out that um, we isolated uh, aggregates too with the vesicles. And we actually could also show that uh, with the vesicles, we had some protein aggregates associated as well. So even in the uh, coated EV samples, we had some protein aggregates with the, with the protein corona too. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I probably, uh, because meanwhile I read the chat and somehow the, the question there was a bit different that it does not have any EV particles. So I'm yes, sorry. I'm maybe, I, maybe I can. Uh, yeah, thank you, it. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, so we controlled for that. So we, we applied two, two different filtration steps, uh, hydrostatic filtration steps and a lower speed like uh, uh, 20,000 G and uh, 100,000 G, 18 hour centrifugation. And this was followed by, by control, both by electron microscopy uh, of the pellet and also by, by the, the uh, uh, flow, um, flow cytometry uh, staining of the pellet. So we, we, we considered that it was vesicle free it didn't uh, seem to have any indication that our EV depleted plasma sample had remaining uh, vesicles. Uh, I mean, uh, the question is just in two parts. Yeah, correct. After 18 hours, we, we, uh, we assume that we don't have EVs, but during the like separation of EVs, we, we also separate the protein, some kind of protein aggregation as well. Uh, and also we could create the protein aggregation while we are using like long time centrifugation. This Absolutely. Is, uh, I was wondering that how can we produce such a this control? Yeah. That's, that, that's a very important point. Yeah, I think uh, sometimes the simple uh, transmission electron microscopy can be, can be meaningful and, and, uh, and, if, if you have uh, EV separation from plasma containing environment, then, then uh, well, I think it's, it's a very tricky uh, task to, to, to make sure that you don't have protein aggregates. Even freezing thawing uh, yeah. induces yeah. aggregation. So if you have frozen samples, then you thaw it up, you induce artificially uh, protein aggregation as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I note now that we have reached the end of the hour, uh, but we have just three questions left. So Edit, Esther, are you willing to donate another five minutes? Sure. Okay, very good. So let's um, let's next go to uh, to Esther Naltatun. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Edith and Esther. And um, I was wondering if you do this exact procedure that you have developed now right, with the nascent EVs and, and dipping them in the, in the plasma sample, uh, do you know or do you think there would also be a specific aggregation around these vesicles of uh, extracellular RNA or DNA molecules? And if you have not done this particular experiment, uh, have you seen any RNA binding proteins in the protein corona? Well, what I remember, it was not RNA binding protein. It was 
lipopolysaccharide binding protein. Uh, the closest it was uh, uh, LPS binding protein. I, I don't remember having seen RNA binding proteins among them, but we didn't uh, purposely uh, have a look. Maybe we should go back to the protein list and, and try to look at it uh, with, with this uh, perspective. Thank you, Esther. Uh, next, John Bissler. Yes, thank you. That was wonderful. It's an easy question. The C3B that you saw in the corona, I'm assuming that it's through the thioester in C3. So how does C3 get bound to the EV? Uh, you had C1Q. Is it the lectin pathway or classical pathway, or how does it get on there? <laughs> it's very, very hard to tell. Alternative pathway would be the more evident one. Uh, at least for me, but but I would like to uh, remind you again that very interesting finding that there is uh, published uh, transmission electron microscopic evidence that inside the multivesicular bodies on the intraluminal vesicles we have bound C3B. Uh, so so. I assume that since the alternative pathway is more ancient and more general, my, my gut feeling is that it, it must have been the alternative pathway, which uh, gave rise to the C3B attachment with a higher probability as compared to the classical one. Do you think it's part of targeting to a C3 uh, receptor? I so, so I think... Uh, this, uh, it, it could be, I mean, if, if you say that the, these complement proteins like C3, uh, C3B are uh, opsonins in terms of the, the corona coating, then yes, of course, we expect that it could be uh, uh, targeting the, the vesicles to complement receptor expressing cells indeed. indeed. Thank you so much. CR1 expressing cells predominantly. And our final question goes to Dirk Strunk. Uh, Dirk. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, thank you for the, for the excellent presentation. Congrats to the, to the paper. Uh, I'm afraid the question is not as easy, but it's the same direction. So about the fibrinogen association, uh, THP1 is famous for expressing tissue factor. And, and in the clotting cascade, tissue factor would, would contribute to uh, fibrinogen fibrin conversion. Did you discuss in the lab whether whether tissue factor could be the trigger for that observation? And in this case, the fibrinogen level should be much less in the platelet EVs? No, we haven't considered that. That's a, that's a great point. Thank you for, for raising it. We haven't thought of that. Thank you. All right. Well, now we are, we're through our, our chat box. Uh, we've uh, gotten to everybody. And um, now it's time to wrap up for the day. Uh, for the night for some of you. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining and for all the great questions. But most of all, I'd like to thank you, Edith Buzesh, and, um, and you, Esther Tote, for, uh, for, for joining us today and for sharing your work um, and, and sharing your perspectives on this, on this very exciting subfield um, that, is, that is rapidly developing. So, um, so, so thank you again. And I hope to see everybody at another EV club sometime soon. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of the week and good luck with your research. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you.